So perhaps the biggest difference between quantum economics and classical economics is that classical economics is based on the idea of a utility function, while um, quantum economics is based on the idea of propensity, which is our probability of mm -hmm. transacting. So instead of having a utility curve to, to model like a consumer or supplier, we're going to use a propensity curve, which describes a probability distribution, let's say the probability of buying or selling at a particular price. So this seems a reasonable way to describe people's behavior. But let's say that we have a start with a probability distribution and we know that they're likely to buy at a certain price, but not at a, at a higher price. So how would we get the quantum model from that? Well, a propensity curve describes information, and this is related to energy through the concept of entropic force. And in order to quantize a system, the first step is to derive the entropic dynamics. Okay, so what is this entropic force? Well, um, it was illustrated by uh, Leo Szilard, the physicist, um, who imagined this uh, thought experiment involving a, a heat engine. So there's a, a, a single particle which is in a chamber at a particular temperature. And we're going to divide the chamber into two parts, so uh, zero and one. So you can imagine this is kind of a minimal representation of a, a logical bit, uh, so that if the particle can be in zero or it can be in one. So let's say that we know the particle is in state one, so we have information about this system. Well, in that case, we could move the piston with uh, no force, because it's not going to encounter that particle. And then we could allow it to open up again, and by doing that, extract work from the system, uh, which is given by this, this formula here. And it depends on the, uh, the logarithm of the final volume over the initial volume, which in this case is going to be logarithm of 2. So this showed that uh, from in having information implies that we, we can get a kind of a force out of it. Conversely, a probability distribution, if we start with that, it can be viewed as the product of a corresponding entropic force. So something like this, um, we, we can say that uh, the, if there's a likelihood of that a particular particle is going to be located within a certain uh, zone, but not outside that zone, we can imagine there's a, a force which is kind of acting on that particle to keep it in that area. So and instead of a particle, it could be an idea or some sort of, a, you know, uh, uh, in economics, uh, something like a, a price estimate. So. The equation for the entropic force is uh, given by this one here. So we have gamma times uh, p prime over p, where p is the probability curve, and um, the energy involved in moving from one place to another is, as in the other experiments, going to involve a uh, logarithm of the final propensity divided by the initial propensity. And in the case of a normal pr propensity curve, the entropic force turns out to be linear. So it's given by this equation here, um, which of course is a, uh, the equation for a spring system. So you can imagine there's just a sort of a spring force which is constraining the probability to stay within a certain range. This entropic force scales with the inverse variance, so this sigma squared term on the bottom, and also with a parameter gamma which uh, is going to be uh, have, have units of energy. And, um, and, and so you can see the, the, the entropic force. So if you have like a, a, a larger variance, then the uh, corresponding entropic force is, is weaker. OK, so let's say that we have this uh, entropic force. So how can we quantize the system to get a probabilistic wave function? Well, uh, the quantum version of a spring system is just the quantum harmonic oscillator. And the, the ground state of this is a normal distribution, and the mass scales with the inverse variance. So this is quite it, uh, this is quite nice because it allows us to get an expression for the mass in terms of the inverse variance. So what happens when you get uh, a buyer and a seller coming together? Well, you're going to have a uh, a propensity curve for the seller is going to be. Uh, sort of at, uh, at a higher price, and the propensity curve for the, the buyer is going to be shifted towards lower prices. And the active part of these um, 
curves is going to be the parts kind of near the mid price. And uh, the if you have the propensity of someone to buy and the propensity of someone to sell at a particular price, then the propensity, the probability of a transaction occurring is just going to be the product of those two things. Um, and it, that turns out to be a scaled normal curve shown here by this uh, shaded area. And the net entropic force associated with this is just the sum of the buyer and seller forces. So this is a very kind of intuitive way of understanding uh, buying and selling transactions. The buyer has a certain force pulling the force uh, down towards a lower price. The, the seller is trying to pull it up to a higher price and uh, you get this sort of probabilistic result. The, um, uh, the, the chance of the probability of transacting when described by that curve uh, is going to uh, scale uh, depending on a number of factors including the, the spread, uh, the distance between the, the buyer and the, the seller sort of optimal prices. Now obviously if there's a big gap between them then the probability of a transaction occurring will be lower. So this, this curve that, you know, this, this diagram that we get here, um, in some ways it's, it's kind of similar toward, to the, the classical supply and demand thing where you have this sort of X shape. But um, in other ways, it's quite different. The, the curves are now representing a probabilistic propensity. There's no unique static equilibrium. There's no assumption that the market will clear and, and so on. And it leads to different kinds of, of simulations. Uh, one thing is that uh, the simulations are obviously they're going to be stochastic because there's only a probability of transactions occurring. And, and these models are used not so much in economics, but they're used very widely in areas such as systems biology, where it's important to take this kind of stochasticity into account. So this is a, uh, a simple model of a supply chain where the, uh, the amount of units sold in a particular week fluctuates up and down randomly because the system is inherently stochastic. Um, the uh, quantum harmonic oscillator, so one difference between that and a normal kind of classical oscillator is that it has these excited states with higher energies. So the, the kind of ground state is this normal curve, but we can also get a, a very high energies. We get this kind of jagged uh, shape, which is a bit reminiscent of the, the quantum walk. Um, so the higher states are not going to be used too much, but just by using the ground state and, and a couple of the uh, next higher energy states, we find that it's possible to fit things like asset price fluctuations in stock markets very well. And, and the, uh, the details are in this paper, a quantum model of supply and demand.